This is chapter three, part B, types of passive membrane transport. Now when we think about our cells, all of our cells are going to be bathed in interstitial fluid, or rather intercellular fluid. The interstitial fluid is what bathes them and what is going to be sitting in between several cells. So notice the prefix inter means between. So we have two different cells here. The intercellular fluid is the inside of them. The interstitial fluid sort of acts like the soup that surrounds them, and it includes a lot of important components, things like amino acids, sugars, many of the nutrients that our body needs. So it includes fatty acids, vitamins, as well as other things like hormones and neurotransmitters. Now, our membranes have a very important characteristic which we refer to as differential permeability or selective permeability. This characteristic of selective permeability allows for only certain molecules to be able to enter and exit the cell. And you can imagine how very important this would be because if important proteins were able to leak the cell, the cell would die. Uh, this is one of the things that can actually happen very quickly if somebody is severely burned precious fluids, proteins, and ions can be lost very quickly from the cell. So in this PowerPoint, in this presentation, we're only going to talk about passive transport because there is a lot of detail to this. The other type of, tra of membrane transport that we'll talk about in the next mini lecture would be active. And active transport uses ATP, but passive transport occurs without ATP. So one of the main hallmarks of passive transport is that molecules are going to travel down a concentration gradient. And so the molecules spread out from high concentration to areas of low concentration. So the first one that we're going to talk about is simple diffusion. And simple diffusion is one of the most important in the body. And in simple diffusion, the example that we see on the screen is the, an example of a concentrated tablet. This could be something like Alka-Seltzer. As soon as you put it into water, it's going to start to diffuse. The molecules are going to move from high concentration in the tablet to areas of low concentration. So now in the third picture, you see that the molecules have spread out from the dry pellet and they have reached homeostasis. So those molecules have spread out to the entire container. And some of the factors that are going to affect the speed of diffusion would be things like the molecular size. And this is important because the smaller the molecular size, the faster the molecule is going to move. This is important because the smaller the molecule, the faster rate of diffusion. Another important factor is going to be the temperature. And the higher the temperature, again, the faster the diffusion rate as well. So we have faster diffusion with a higher temperature. Now, the plasma membrane, as we have learned in the last mini lecture is a hydrophobic core. And so the molecules that can diffuse very easily would be things that would be lipid soluble, because we know that likes dissolve likes. The other items that can also diffuse would be small molecules that can pass through the membrane. These would be things like oxygen and carbon dioxide. And some of the other examples of simple diffusion that we're going to talk about are shown on the next slide. So letter A is the same picture you have in your book, and this is simple diffusion. So these would be lipid-soluble substances, so they can easily pass through the membrane. These would be things like um, alcohol, for example. This is one reason that alcohol passes into our cells very, very quickly, because it's also a lipid. And again, likes dissolve likes. Other examples would be oxygen 
as well as carbon dioxide. Now, when there are other molecules that need a little help, they utilize what's called facilitated diffusion. And the word facilitate means to help. So in this case, there's going to be some sort of protein which acts as the helper molecule. And it's going to assist in allowing a certain molecule to cross the membrane. So the two types of facilitated diffusion are either carrier mediated facilitated diffusion and channel mediated facilitated diffusion. In carrier mediated facilitated diffusion there are integral proteins, proteins that are going to cross the entire membrane and they are specific for polar molecules or other classes of molecules. So things like sugars and amino acids would utilize facilitated diffusion. A good example of this would be glucose being transported across the membrane. So it needs a little help, but it's still going to be passive. It still means that molecules go from a high concentration to a low concentration. The next example is channel-mediated facilitated diffusion. And a common example of this occurring would be the movement of ions through different channels. And in this case, we can have either leakage channels, ones that are always going to be open and allow ions or water to move across the concentration gradient, or we could have gated channels. Gated channels would be ones that are open or closed based on other electrical impulses. And then the last type that we have of passive movement is osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. And this is very, very important in the body. In a lot of times there is a specific protein that you can see here. This protein is called an aquaporin. And these aquaporins are actually going to form in the membranes of red blood cells as well as kidney tubule cells. But another mechanism that water uses to get through membranes is this water molecule actually sort of just wiggles its way through the membrane which is quite an amazing thing. So water can enter um, without the use of these aquaporins or it can just kind of wiggle its way through the membrane. This slide is showing a figure you have in your book and it's comparing uh, two different U-tubes. This is a U-tube experiment. And before we, um, we talk about this, we need to talk about um, a couple different types of membranes. At the top, in letter A, we have a freely permeable membrane. And a freely permeable membrane is going to be a membrane that allows basically anything to pass through from one cell to another. So this is not what we have in our body. So this is not in our cells. And I want you to look at this YouTube membrane. We have I want you to imagine that this would be cell A, this would be cell B. Cell A, cell B. So what's going to happen here is we see that there are more sugar molecules in cell B compared to cell A. So in order to reach homeostasis, both the solute and the water are going to move back and forth. And they can do this because there is a freely permeable membrane. So everything reaches equilibrium in this second U-tube. However, as we have already learned in our cells, we have what is called a selectively permeable membrane. And so this means that the membrane can select for what actually goes into the whatever what actually goes from one cell to another cell. So again, this is cell A, cell B, cell A, and cell B. However, since we have a selectively permeable membrane, the only molecule that will pass would be the water. And this is what would happen in the human body. The solutes are what are called non-permeable. They are too large to pass. They're too large to pass from one cell to another cell. So the only thing that really can move is going to be the water.
So when we now look at this situation on the left compartment over here at the bottom, there is less solutes. And in the right compartment, which is cell B, there are more solutes. So since the solutes now cannot move, water is going to move from its high concentration to low concentration. And in cell A, there is more water than there is in cell B. There is less, there is less water. So water is going to move down its concentration gradient. It's going to move from A to B. So we see that's exactly what happens here. So water moves from A to B. And now we see that there is a different volume of water in each solution. Now, the movement of water is dictated by a term which we call osmolarity. And osmolarity is defined in your textbook. Osmolarity is really the total concentration of solutes. The total concentration of solutes in the fluid. So the more solutes that we have, the higher osmolarity we would have. So as you can see, B has a higher osmolarity than A does. And water is always going to go down its concentration gradient. This is going to be important in determining whether cells are going to shrink or whether they are going to, sell, to, um, to swell. This picture in your book shows the effects of varying tonicities on living red blood cells. So first we need to define the word tonicity. And the word tonicity kind of looks like the word tone. This slide is in your textbook and it's showing the tonicity of different solutions. So we first need to define the word tonicity. Tonicity is the ability of a solution to change shape. And it's going to change that shape by altering its water volume. So it can either swell or burst, or it could shrink or crenate. However, if it's in a tonic solution, which has the same amount of solutes as the inside of the cell, then nothing is going to happen. It's going to maintain its normal size. So in our first slide here, we have an isotonic solution. And in our body, an isotonic solution is defined as having a concentration of 0.9% saline, which is NaCl, or a concentration of 5% glucose. Both of these would basically be bathing the cell, and the cell would be in homeostasis, an isotonic solution. In a hypertonic solution, the hyper means that there is a greater osmolarity in the solution that's surrounding the cell. So all these terms are referring to the solution surrounding the cell. In a hypertonic solution, there is less water on the um, outside than the inside. So since there's more water on the inside, water is going to exit the cell so that the cell shrinks or crenates. A hypotonic solution is going to be the opposite of this. It means there are fewer solutes on, around the cell and greater water. So the water is going to rush into the cell and thus the cell is going to burst or it is going to lyse. Now the reason these are very important in the human body is they're used to treat either a patient who has edema. So in a situation where a person has edema they have cells that are over, they have way too much water in them, so we want to give them something to remove the water. So in this case, what would happen is the, um, their medical care professional would administer a hypertonic solution, and this hypertonic solution would draw water out of the cell. If somebody has dehydrated cells, so their cell is crenated and shriveled up, we want to get water back into their cells, so they're going to administer a hypotonic solution. And examples of hypotonic solution that are commonly used would be things like sports drinks, uh, Gatorade, Powerade, 
apple juice, things of those natures, nature would help to rehydrate the cell. This is a summary slide of what we've talked about with the passive membrane transport mechanisms. Simple diffusion is with fats, small molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide. So for example, in the lungs, there's going to be a higher amount of carbon dioxide in the lungs than the blood. So the carbon dioxide diffuses down its concentration gradient, but there's more oxygen in the blood compared to the lungs, so it diffuses in the opposite direction. And the reverse of this happens at the tissues. So this is simple diffusion, very, very important to our body, maintaining homeostasis. We then have facilitated diffusion, which remember just means to help. These are going to be required when there are larger molecules, larger molecules than oxygen or carbon dioxide. So glucose and some ions are going to use this mechanism. They could either be carrier mediated or they can be channel mediated. We then also have osmosis, which is the diffusion of water. And so we're going to have hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic solutions. And kind of a simple way to remember this is, let's say we have a cell that has is in a hypertonic solution. And what's important is the non-diffusible particles. So in this case, the little red dots represent those non-diffusible particles. And we can see that there are more of them on the outside than the inside. So we know that this is a hypertonic solution. And you can see that there now is more water on the inside compared to the outside. So water goes down its concentration gradient until the water equilibrates. The solutes, again, do not move. So all of these, remember, they are passive. So there is the movement of particles from high concentration to low concentration. From high to low.